for everyone. All right, thank you, Kendall. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first meeting of the Freight Stakeholders Task Force, previously known as the Freight Stakeholders Working Group. Thank you all for being here this morning. I'm gonna share my screen, pull up the agenda. Hopefully that works. Can folks see my agenda? Yes. Yes. Great, thank you. All right, so welcome, good morning. My name is Tim Garrett. I'm a regional planner uh, with Sandag on the Goods Movement Planning Team. Um, so thank you all for being here. We'll ask that um, attendees please put their name and organization in the chat box for, your for our records. So name and organization. And uh, we'll also put the link in the chat box with the agenda to download. Annabelle, do you have that? Put it in their chat. Otherwise, uh, be sharing it on the screen here. So that was a uh, welcome to introductions. Uh, we'll move to just quickly to item number two um, is the meeting minutes. So previously we uh, had a formal action to approve the minutes, but now that we're a uh, task force, um, it's not required, um, but we can definitely, you know, we invite you to review the minutes, take a look and see if there's any corrections to make um, and make any comments if, if uh, necessary. Um, so I'll pull up item number two here. And if you scroll to item two in the agenda that you have um, on your own screen, um, definitely please take a moment to look at that. And if there are any comments, you can either raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you, or we can, uh, you can put it in the chat and we can correct it after the meeting. Let's see, I can't see hands raised. Annabelle, do you see any hands raised? I do not yet. Okay. Just provide a minute. Take a look at the meeting minutes here. So please take a look at the minutes after the meeting. If you have anything to correct, um, you can definitely send me an email and we'll get that corrected for you. So we'll go back to uh, the agenda here. Uh, we'll go for public comments as the next item, number three. Um, so attended for members of the public here. Um, there's an item later on, number nine, for agency updates. So if you have an agency update, please wait to, um, to do that. Um, otherwise, if there's many um, members of the public who'd like to make a comment, um, please raise your hand now. Not seeing any. Annabelle, do you see any hands? I do not. Okay. All right, great. We'll move on to number four, uh, which is the charter. Um, so this is attachment uh, number four in the agenda. Uh, so I'll click on it here. So there's uh, not too much substantive change from the previous version. Previously, this was the Freight Stakeholders Working Group, as I mentioned, um, except that uh, now it's the task force. Um, so the charter is designed to be more general, um, not as specific in terms of the things that we'll be working on and addressing in this meeting. Um, so because we don't wanna have to change the charter frequently, but there's gonna be the next item uh, is the work plan that uh, is a little bit more specific. So just to summarize um, what the charter has, um, begins with a statement of purpose. Goods movement is important for economic vitality in our region, but uh, disadvantaged communities adjacent to freight infrastructure have borne the brunt of negative impacts, especially in terms of air quality. Sandag prioritizes the equitable distribution of benefits and burdens created by goods movement. Freight Stakeholders Task Force, that's this group, the subject group of subject matter experts um, providing critical input on Sandag work and regional plan implementation. The work plan with planned meetings and agenda items will be developed, and we plan to revisit the work plan annually and update it if necessary. We want to reach a broad audience with this group, uh, including stakeholders in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors who want to contribute to the development of our goods movement plans and studies. Meetings and materials are open to the public, so please feel free to forward and involve your colleagues and industry partners in these meetings. Finally, meetings will be as needed, um, but we expect to meet about once per quarter and meetings will run one and a half to two hours each. 
Importantly, we view this task force as a, as a critical means of receiving input on our planning efforts. So we encourage and welcome your participation uh, to get the best possible outcomes in our, in our work. So there's no formal action required here, um, but we welcome any comments and uh, would like to incorporate those into the finalized version of the charter, which will be posted on the agency website. So love to hear if there's any comments um, from the group, feel free to raise your hand um, and uh, speak now. That'd be great. Any comments on the, the charter for the task force? All right, not seeing any hands. Hopefully you're all happy with the charter. Thanks for taking a look at that. And once again, please take a look after the meeting. If you have other comments, uh, feel free to email me. So go to the next item. First few ones here, just uh, administrative business. Uh, the next, next item is the, the work plan. So I'll scroll to that. It's attachment number five, um, attached to the agenda. So the work plan is a companion document to the charter, but this one we expect to revisit and update annually um, to reflect current and expected work efforts so that you have an idea of what we'll be talking about for the next several meetings. So this is the first iteration. Um, and we'll note that the Freight Stakeholders Task Force will serve as the technical advisory committee for two projects that you'll be hearing about today. The San Diego and Imperial Counties Sustainable Freight Implementation Strategy and the San Diego Regional Medium and Heavy Duty Zero Emission Vehicle Blueprint. This means that we'll be relying on input from the task force for, for both of these projects with specific goals sp spelled out in the task force um, work plan. So for the sustainable freight strategy, this means articulating a vision statement, developing evaluation criteria, confirming assumptions based on your subject matter expertise, and commenting on project deliverables. For the blueprint, the medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle blueprint, the goals for the group include the identification of best practices, trends, and barriers for medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle adoption, quantitative and qualitative infrastructure goals, confirming study assumptions, and commenting on project deliverables. Both of these projects are on the agenda today, uh, and likely every meeting for the next year and a half as we uh, involve, as, as we move along in the, pro in the projects. Additional topics that we expect to address um, through this work uh, task force are updates on the Senate Bill 671 work group, comprehensive multimodal, multimodal corridor plans for corridors throughout our region, and we'll have an update on that later, um, the Port of San Diego's maritime clean air strategy and other plans, community emissions reductions plans uh, for Assembly Bill 617 communities, and we have um, three of them, the port side uh, neighborhoods, um, the International Border Community and the Colexco El Centro Heber Corridor in Imperial County. I also expect to have items um, for projects in the working waterfront area, such as Harbor Drive and Vesta Bridge, as well as border and trade data analysis. And if you have additional topic ideas that we should cover as a group, uh, please contact me, either raise your hand now, uh, mention them, you can email me after and uh, we can include them. So once again, no formal actions required here, but we'll welcome any comments uh, and would like to incorporate those um, and we'll post the finalized version on the agency website. So any comments on the task force work plan? These are the items we'll be covering uh, throughout the next year. Okay, great. So we will move on to our first uh, substantive item then for the day. Um, it's uh, going back to the agenda. This is the item number six. So this is the San Diego and Imperial Counties Sustainable Freight Implementation Strategy update. Um, so we'll go over to Mariela Rodriguez uh, to share her screen and presentation. So Mariela, please take it away. Thank you, team. Let me share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Great. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mariela Rodriguez, as Tim said. I'm an associate regional planner with the Goods Movement team and the PM for the San Diego and Imperial County Sustainable Freight Strategies. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending this meeting today. 
Today, uh, we are here with Annabelle Grelish and Tim Garrett from Sandag and our consulting team. That's Bridget Wehar and Sebastian Guerrero from WSB. We're going to be presenting the project goals and the expected outcomes, the project timeline, and the draft existing plans and studies. Then we will be providing an overview of the best practices and draft screening framework, which are the sections highlighted in pink on the agenda. <clears throat> During this part of the presentation, we will be asking all of you to access an application on your phone or computer to provide feedback and any comments that you may have. And finally, we'll go over the next steps. The state has established ambitious uh, climate, air climate and air quality and public health goals and has uh, recently prioritized transitioning the freight sector to sustainable technologies. To make, that, to make sure that San Diego County and Imperial County meet these goals, Sandag and the Imperial County Transportation Commission, ICTC, is developing this strategy to systematically implement freight, freight projects and policies to transition the region to a more sustainable, equitable, and economically competitive freight transportation system. The strategy will develop and strengthen partnerships between public agencies, committee, community members, and the private sector through extensive collaboration and input to develop the strategy. We will address environmental justice concerns from freight impacts by incorporating input from our region's disadvantaged communities through the public outreach efforts. We would also seek innovative technologies, identify federal, state, and additional funding sources for implementations of those te technologies. And also will address workforce gaps in the implementation, in implementing new technologies by creating a workforce development toolkit. <clears throat> so here's the project timeline, but before we go into it, I want to mention to this group, that this group, as Tim described earlier in the, in the meeting, will serve as the project technical advisory committee. So your engagement in this will be crucial in developing the, develop, the, in developing the strategy. Throughout the project, the team will be presenting the draft deliverables. We'll provide the documents in advance for you to give us input and feedback during these meetings. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the timeline, you can see that we kicked off the project in February, and since then the team has developed a project work plan, schedule public engagement plan, which is posted in the project website, and we can provide that link. Um, and the consulting team has been conducting stakeholders interviews. Today we are presenting the draft existing conditions and the proposed screening framework. And based on your input, we will finalize the existing conditions report by the end of this month. Your input on the proposed framework will inform the innovative strategy development and screening. And we will come back to you to present the draft uh, sometime during November. Between um, the next month and the end of the year, we will conduct focus groups. And then between March and April of 2023, we will conduct public uh, survey focus on the general public. In spring and summer of 2023, we will be developing and presenting the implementation plan. The draft sustainable phrase strategy report, which will consolidate the, uh, in a report all the deliverables, deliverables previously uh, mentioned, will be presented in the fall of 2023. And the final strategy is scheduled to be completed by January 24. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Bridget and Sebastian, who will start by, the, by presenting the draft existing conditions. Thanks, Marilla. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Marilla. So we did um, an extensive literature review looking at uh, studies, uh, of ways of improving the sustainability of the freight transportation system, uh, uh, looking at regional, state, uh, federal, 
um, uh, previous examples. Um, and really the objective here was to uh, figure out uh, what is the cutting edge of what is being implemented out there? Uh, what are the best practices and lessons learned? Uh, and how can we implement them in the San Diego region? Uh, here, we're just uh, showing the covers of a couple of the more relevant studies. Uh, we recently completed uh, an assessment of, uh, of, of how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for, for the city of Portland. Uh, and that's the, the first one on the left. Uh, there's recently from NCHRP, a study on uh, 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 clean truck uh, strategies, which was very relevant. Uh, the National Academies of Science came up with a two volume report uh, on greenhouse on reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of medium and heavy duty trucks. And that's again, had a lot of good, good content. Uh, and the American Trucking Association recently published uh, their own report uh, on how to reduce emissions in the sector. And so we also looked at that as well, uh, as long as, uh, as well as looking at uh, about another 50 or 60 other studies uh, in total. Next slide. And so as I said, the objective was to, to synthesize, you know, what are the regional, state, national best and international best practices. Uh, as you've all seen, uh, we developed a, a matrix uh, in the white paper that's been shared with you. Uh, and this matrix uh, has lists all these different strategies uh, uh, by different categories, and then also presents some of the more uh, important examples of where they've been implemented uh, and the success that's been achieved. Next slide. And so we're not going to go into all of them in great detail here, uh, but but you know happy to answer questions at the end. Uh, but we just want to talk briefly about some of the some of the findings we we, uh, we came across. Um, and and so first, you know, we'll talk about uh, technology strategies. Uh, and and as you see from the two pictures here, these are these are trucks. Uh, and there's a whole array of technologies related to improving the fuel economy of trucks. Um, you know, one, one little factoid I often tell people, um, uh, the, the trucking sector in the U.S. Uh, emits as much greenhouse gas emissions as, as the whole country of Italy. Uh, so that's just to give you a sense of, of, of how much a fuel is being combusted and how many emissions are being produced. Uh, in the movement of freight, you know, from where it's uh, from where it's being produced and consumed, or where it's coming through a through an airport or through a terminal uh, to warehouses, so those movements of freight really generate a lot of uh, pollution uh, and and negative ex externalities and and environmental impacts. So some of the technologies that are very relevant, uh, we have uh, a number of uh, what we call fuel saving technologies. Uh, so these are off-the-shelf technologies that, that many of which have been implemented in the West Coast uh, in the past couple of years uh, around uh, improving the aerodynamics uh, of the trucks, the, the deflectors on the cabs, uh, uh, the side skirts on the trailers. Uh, there's a thing called the boat tail. You often see them in the back of the trailer, and that reduces some of the drag uh, behind the vehicle. Uh, and all of that combines to, to reduce emissions considerably. Uh, and, and many of them are mandated in California. There, there was a, a rule many years ago uh, and, and they've been implemented. Uh, there's, there's also options to go above and beyond that with, uh, with uh, uh, different types of, uh, of low viscosity uh, lubricants and low rolling resistance tires. Uh, so there's a number of things that can still be done beyond what's, what's mandated. Uh, but, but yeah, there's still significant opportunities in just improving the fuel economy of the trucks on the roads at the moment. There's technologies like truck platooning, which has been around for a long time as a concept, uh, not really much implementation, uh, but there, there always seems to be a, a startup or a company that, that's just around the corner going to implement this. Uh, this essentially is, is forming a platoon of trucks uh, on the highway, uh, which would reduce the, the aerodynamic drag on the trailing trucks uh, and improve the fuel economy and the efficiency of that platoon. Um, there really aren't um, uh, many examples out there in the world where this has been used commercially, uh, but the you know the technology exists, and as trucks become more uh, embedded with uh, with uh, driver aids and connected and autonomous tech, then some of these platooning uh, uh, approaches might become feasible. Uh, truck electrification. There's been tremendous uh, investment and research in this area uh, in the past uh, in the past decade, especially in the past five years. 
Uh, there's a whole there's a host of uh, electric trucks that are coming onto the market. Um, they're they're hard to get a uh, to get your hands on, even if you have the money. They're about three to four times more expensive than a conventional truck. Uh, but even if you have the money to buy those trucks, uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's actually difficult to get your hands on one of them at the moment. There's uh, lead times of a couple of years. Uh, but you know, once production ramps up and some of the supply chain uh, challenges get figured out, uh, you're going to start seeing a lot more electric trucks on the roads. Uh, and the same applies to alternative fuels such as hydrogen or compressed natural gas. Uh, you know, those would would have uh, a different uh, you know benefits in terms of emissions as well. Uh, there's also technologies around reducing the idling of trucks. You know, when trucks uh, trucks spend a lot of their time parked. Uh, you know, both, you know, mandated by regulations that the drivers have to rest X number of hours a day, uh, but then also the drivers just waiting for the next load to be assigned or, uh, or waiting at the gate uh, before uh, their delivery window, uh, where they have an appointment to go make a pickup. Uh, so they spend a lot of time just stopped and, and, and idling typically, you know, it's very hot outside and, you know, they want to run the electronics in the cab. Uh, so there's a number of technologies around uh, battery powered uh, uh, units that replace the engine electricity. Uh, there's also at parking facilities technologies uh, around uh, HVAC hookups into the cabs, and and uh, and so where the where the driver can plug into um, into a station and not have to run the engine continuously. Uh, and those have been deployed pretty, uh, pretty widely around the U.S., uh, but not as much as they should be. Uh, and then finally, there's there's all these technologies around. Uh, improving, you know, not just the greenhouse gas emissions that come out of the trucks, but also the criteria pollutants, uh, you know, reducing emissions of particulate matter, uh, v VOCs, NOx, uh, sulfur, et cetera. And, you know, California is at the, at the forefront of that, uh, honestly. Uh, but, uh, and there's more that, uh, that CARB is implementing over the coming years. Next slide. Then we have a set of strategies that revolve around how do we how do we use existing technologies better uh, around improving the management of fleets or improving the operations and logistics, um, you know things like uh, off hour deliveries, uh, where where you're making deliveries uh, not during the congested peak hours of the morning or in the afternoon, but at night, for example, uh, or on weekends. Uh, you know, that's been used successfully in New York and in Toronto and in a couple other places. Um, uh, talked a little bit about truck parking. You can improve uh, the ease and the availability of truck parking, uh, both in facilities uh, within your region and then also curbside. Uh, what that means is it allows trucks to park quickly and not have to circle around the block multiple times. Uh, you know, trying to find the space, you know, which creates congestion on the roads, it creates more truck VMT, more emissions, more safety risk. Uh, so that could also be beneficial. Uh, there's also a variety of concepts around urban consolidation uh, and micro hubs. Uh, what that's all about uh, is by consolidating freight in urban areas, uh, you're able to then transfer that freight into vehicles that are greener, and, and, and better for, for an urban environment. They could be electric trucks, they could be smaller, um, uh, they could be cargo bikes as, as the next example here shows. Um, and, and with cargo bikes uh, actually are very efficient at delivering freight in, a, in, a, in your dense urban core uh, because you don't have to find parking. You know, it's much easier to park a cargo bike uh, than, than a big truck. And so you're able to you know, park quickly, get your packages in and out of uh, uh, households, uh, apartment buildings, you know, whatever. Uh, and so cargo bikes have been used quite successfully in Toronto, uh, uh, Portland, and a bunch of other cities as well. Uh, delivery lockers, you know, you see these uh, nowadays everywhere at, uh, you know, grocery stores, you know, Amazon has their delivery lockers, um, you know, uh, and, and other companies as well. Uh, we're still, the U.S. is still a little bit behind Europe and especially Germany in this area. Uh, where delivery lockers are much, much greater use. Uh, that's essentially eliminating that last mile uh, truck trip, uh, you know, to the person's home, you know, to the bit and replacing it with, uh, with this convenient pickup location. And so it's essentially eliminating some of the VMT on the roads. And then there's finally the potential for, you know, kinds of drones and delivery robots. Um, a lot of that is still, 
you know, being researched and somewhat speculative. But you could see, you know, in the medium to long term, some of these technologies are replacing some of the truck VMT that's currently uh, in our cities. Next slide. And then finally, we have a series of strategies uh, around the infrastructure. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the top one here is uh, what we call sustainable congestion relief. So, you know, that's, that's not, uh, you know, doubling the number of lanes on the highways, right? That's going to induce a lot more demand, a lot more traffic, a lot more emissions. Uh, but, that, but that's really about uh, finding what are the key bottlenecks, you know, the areas in your roadway network uh, that are causing a lot of delay and backups. Uh, and fixing those bottlenecks so that the network as a whole can operate much more efficiently. Uh, and that will, you know, that would essentially, re, you know, improve safety, reduce emissions, uh, and, you know, benefit the competitiveness of the freight sector altogether. Uh, we also, we don't want to just, for, you know, trucks are the number one contributor to emissions, uh, but we don't want to forget about the other modes, obviously. Uh, you know, rail uh, emits a lot less than truck on a, on a per ton mile basis. You know, about it's about uh, a half to about a tenth uh, of the emission. So, so the more that Sandak can do uh, to enhance the competitiveness of rail, uh, of connecting rail, uh, you know, freight rail from San Diego to the rest of the country, uh, the the more truck trips that can be uh, diverted from the roadway system. Uh, so, the more freight you can run, you know, especially those long haul, you know, five hundred mile plus moves. The more of that freight you can move uh, on the rail system, uh, the more emissions you're going to be avoiding. Uh, and so that, that's critical to uh, make sure that rail can operate efficiently, has the adequate capacity, especially going up north in the coast, uh, and that your terminals ha have adequate access uh, so that uh, freight can get in and out of those terminals efficiently. There's also uh, dedicated truck lanes. You know, Again, another concept that's been talked about for a while uh, a lot of research here. The only real example in the U.S. is in New Jersey. Um, uh, there's been uh, uh, several other um, st uh, studies and, and projects, more prominently in Atlanta at the moment. Uh, but it's been difficult to get dedicated truck lanes, you know, for for obvious for obvious reasons. Uh, but but when you have a a very congested corridor uh, with a lot of through freight, uh, these types of lanes become. Uh, become much more logical and start making sense. Uh, and then, you know, we've talked about uh, truck parking, and so you can expand the parking facilities and, and make it easier for trucks to park. Again, that will improve the efficiency of your system altogether. Uh, and then there's also a variety of uh, ITS solutions, um, uh, uh, you know, around uh, freight signal priority and all kinds of uh, advanced uh, notification systems for the drivers. Uh, and we've talked about some of those uh, in the report we've put together. Next slide. So I want to uh, stop here for a moment and just uh, ask the group if there's uh, any questions or if did we miss anything, um, you know, any other strategy that we should be looking at that would, uh, you know, improve the sustainability of the freight transportation system uh, and, and also, uh, you know, ensure that it remains competitive in the decades to come. I mean, did, did we really, did we miss anything? Tim, can I make a comment really quickly? Yeah, please go ahead, Ty. Um, one um, other um, entity that you may wish to include, um, you know, as uh, a feedback mechanism for um, the smaller operators is an organization called OOIDA. It's Owner Operators Independent Drivers Association to give you a little bit more perspective on the implementation and uh, adoption of uh, ZEVs from uh, the perspective of the owner operator. Great, right. thank you, Ty. Go. That's yeah, I see a hand from Mark. Yep. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to share that <clears throat> for Imperial, I think it's important to note that, that Imperial does does see the opportunity for more intermodal uh, connectivity um, as um, you know there are opportunities for intermodal uh, facilities north of the county um, that may tie to this future lithium extraction development 
um, as well as uh, other near the border. Um, and then regarding uh, uh, truck storage facilities, uh, there, there's an effort to pursue um, coal storage facilities in the border area. Um, and, and more warehousing is certainly is, is a future opportunity in the Calexico East Port of Entry area as uh, there's plenty of land available and, uh, and, and of course the border has, has its uh, own market of truck travel. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else? If you um, don't feel comfortable speaking up or are not quite ready to give your comments, you can uh, add them in the chat or uh, send them by email afterwards to Mariella or myself. Um, and our contact information is on the last slide. But anything else, anyone want to speak up now? Okay, great. Shall we move on, Mariella? Yes. Great. So um, this is some context. We're heading now into the description of the um, screening framework. And as some context for that, this SANDAG 2021 regional plan had a definition of sustainability that is listed here, um, shown here. So it really focuses on meeting current economic, environmental, and community needs without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So we wanted to keep that in mind as this is a sustainability focused effort. And the next slide. And then another piece of context for developing the um, screening framework is the uh, sort of international sustainability implementation steps. This is just one example, there are many of them, but it shows the, uh, that there are numerous steps involved in developing and implementing a sustainability um, plan. So we're this effort is really sort of in the early stages of the steps laid out here, which are sort of talk and engage, assess and prioritize, which is where the, the screening uh, framework comes in, commit and collaborate um, with others uh, will also be part of this effort uh, as we go forward. And then after this um, implementation strategy, is uh, ex adopted, there will be uh, a need to measure and report and then educate and communicate uh, going forward. So this just kind of puts the current effort in a, a continuous um, framework. Next slide. And then pulling from uh, what Mariella described in terms of the the purpose and need, the goals, and the um, expected outcomes of this effort, we've developed a proposed vision statement. Uh, and it's stated here, implement multimodal freight related projects and policies that improve sustainability and lessen disproportionate environmental health burdens on disadvantaged communities and tribal governments while supporting the region's economy and its role as a trade gateway. So again, the, the focus in this vision statement is really on the sustainability, but keeping in mind uh, the historically disproportionate environmental health burdens on disadvantaged communities and also the need to keep uh, freight uh, uh, moving in terms of the economy. So I wanna pause on this slide um, for a minute and take some, uh, any comments, feedback, anything that's missing from this vision statement or any concerns about it? Okay. 
I don't see any hands or comments on the chat, but if anybody has any comments uh, or feedback on it. Yeah, hi, this is Jeff Oyos from Sandag. Uh, I have a question, Mariella, about this disadvantaged communities section here. Are we talking about the you know the state defined disadvantaged community uh, AB 805 or, or are we looking more broadly? And if so, is it maybe that a different term that could be used to think about communities of concern I, um, or, or is this grant defined looking specifically at disadvantaged communities as defined by the state? So that's a great quest question. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we are gonna go um, later in the presentation into the criteria for the framework and uh, the disadvantaged communities and equity rather um, is one of uh, those criteria that we're gonna be using for the screening and we're gonna get uh, feedback from everybody uh, in this call. Uh, but in short, we have in, in mind the definition from the standard uh, regional plan. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mariella, I also um, have a quick question. Um, and that is with regard to um, the, you know this statement or really anything uh, related to um, uh, you know supporting disadvantaged communities will uh, the very smallest businesses and small operators be included in that um, understanding of how uh, a sustainability strategy might you know affect them, especially like, the small trucking uh, operations that have one truck and you know are supporting a family on a one truck um, income that that kind of thing. Thank you, Ty. Um, I don't know if uh, Bridget you want to chime in, but um, in through this process in this early stage of the project, we have been engaging with um, truck operators. Uh, for the art interviews. So um, they do have a voice and they will have a voice obviously uh, throughout the project. Yeah, and then just to add to that, we're doing, a, a as Mariella mentioned, a small number of stakeholder interviews. Now we're also doing some focus groups a little bit later, um, but Ty, we would love, we, you know, as you know, <laughs> I worked with you before, it's difficult to get people uh, who are busy delivering freight or uh, especially with the current supply chain issues to uh, take time out of their busy days to engage. We are, uh, we have been successful in getting some interviews, but if you have some um, particular suggestions, we could add them to the list either for interviews and or the focus group. So we would really love to engage with a range as you're pointing out, not just the big operators, but um, some uh, smaller ones as well. I'll um, work with you offline on that, Bridget, and we'll see if we can round up a couple. How's that? Thanks. Perfect. Hello, Thanks. Bridget. This is Alan V. Hill with Charger Logistics, and you, you guys can count me in, my company in, to be one of those stakeholders. Um, we're, we're just entering the West uh, Coast with, with uh, aggressive plans for the Imperial Valley as well as Otay Mesa. Fantastic. We'll reach out to you. Thank you. Uh, anything else on the vision statement? All right. I think we can, yeah, move on. Okay, thanks. So um, now I'm going to, um, describe a little bit more how we would actually evaluate the proposed criteria and scoring of um, potential projects and programs. So focusing on the areas of um, interests that have been set forth again in the outcomes and the vision statement and all of the, the context for this study, we have identified environment, 
equity and economy as a sort of really key focus. It's a sustainable effort, but because it's focused around freight, we also want to take into account both equity and the economy. So, and you can see at the big picture level, what we're looking at in terms of, of benefits scoring uh, is the, and this is again in the, in the paper that uh, we distribute in advance, but uh, we're giving more, we're proposing giving more weight to criteria around the environment because again, sustainability is, is the reason behind this, the driving reason. So 50% of the weighting. And we would look at uh, criteria and largely this would be evaluated qualitatively impact on reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, impact on reducing emissions of criteria pollutants. And then in terms of equity, uh, we would propose to give that 25% of the weight. And uh, this may get more to your question, Jeff, that we are uh, proposing to use the definition in the um, Sandegg's 2021 regional plan, uh, the degree to which benefits accrue to disadvantaged communities. Those are AB 805 and the top 25% of those communities as a state definition, and then the degree to which benefits accrue to um, community-based organization network communities in the top 50%. And so um, what we're looking at is a combination of, of giving a little bit more weight or giving uh, more weight to those in the top 25%, and then still though not ignoring those that are in the top 50% of those disadvantaged communities. And then in terms of the economy, uh, we're looking at, again, another 25% uh, total weighting. And we're looking at anything that improves the efficiency, speeds, and reliability of the freight transportation system as benefiting the economy. And hopefully also it would, it would uh, benefit the environment, but that would be evaluated separately. And then improving the capacity of the freight system to accommodate expected increases because they are uh, freight um, volumes are expected to continue to increase um, dramatically over the next few years. So that's the overall um, framework we're proposing in terms of the criteria and scoring. And so uh, we want to turn to Annabelle to um, take us through some polling questions to get your feedback. Thank you, Bridget. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. My name is Annabelle Grealish, and I am a transportation planning intern here at Sandag. Right now, we'll be pivoting to Mentimeter, which is a polling software to solicit some feedback on the implementation strategy scoring of benefits. And we'll be coming back once more to the software after the poll. So please do not exit your windows. We can come back to it quickly. So if everyone would please follow the instructions on the screen, and we can begin the first poll. And we're looking for a critical mass of participants. So I'll wait a few minutes for everyone to get signed in and ready. On the bottom right, you'll see how many are in the, the room right now. And we have about 30 people that I'm shooting for. And while uh, we're waiting for people to join the room, I did see a hand from Stephen Schaefer. Um, we're going to be this is kind of like an interactive session. So if you'd like, Stephen, uh, hold your comment, or if you'd like to bring it up now, feel free to go ahead. Uh, maybe while you're going into it, I just, I was a little surprised there's no safety criterion in environment and equity. And I know that's always challenging, but it, when we've met with Barrio Logan and other communities, I think they don't always talk about trucking concerns through safety. But when you hear the comments, a lot of times I think it is safety related. So you might just consider if there's a way. I, I know environment is usually air quality, but it's just something you might want to think about if you can integrate it in there somehow. Um, yeah, and I may ask uh, Sebastian to help me answer this. Um, <laughs> so safety was one that we, okay, whenever we develop these uh, screening framework, it's really, we try to keep it as focused as possible on the specific goals of a study because you know there's a lot of things you can study and you can really dilute 
dilute the um, results. focus and results if you have too many criteria that are uh, sort of tangentially related. But safety is one that is, you know, core to everything to do with transportation. So we had it in at one point. Ultimately, it wasn't listed in any of the sort of founding documents um, for this. So we 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 took it out. But it it's a good point that specifically you're saying in terms of equity, and this is absolutely the case that we found uh, recently in Portland, and I'm sure in other places as well, that safety is one of the, the big concerns in uh, communities that are heavily impacted by freight. So, um, you know, I, I guess I'm acknowledging that that's somewhat, that I was somewhat on the fence about it. And Sebastian, do you have any further thoughts? No, that I mean that that's exactly you know what we discussed. Um, we wanted to um, you know focus on a narrow set of criteria um, so that you know that that makes it you know easier for, uh, uh, for us. But but it really makes the recommendations a lot a lot more 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 powerful. Uh, if you try to include everything at once, you end up you know uh, you know not really prioritizing or scoring things. Um, and then, and then we think that safety is probably best treated with its separate study. Um, you know, a lot of the strategies and solutions that address safety, um, you know, obviously have important equity uh, impacts, uh, but they they don't move the needle as much in in greenhouse gas emissions or, or criteria pollutants. Um, and so it's it's kind of a different framework that's needed to look at safety issues. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it is, I mean, it's obviously uh, of, of utmost importance. Um, you know, we, we, we took it out, uh, as Bridget said, because it, it wasn't highlighted, uh, in the, in the goals of this study. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll discuss with, uh, with the project team and with Sandag and, you know, figure out if that's something we can add. Yeah. And one, one way we may, uh, Mariella, we, we can talk about bringing it in, maybe just in the specific context of equity. So we're going to be doing focused outreach to um, disadvantaged communities, particularly impacted by freight, and to the extent that uh, specific issues or concerns around safety come up, maybe we include those as being the degree to which the benefits would go to disadvantaged communities, you know, so a safety project in a disadvantaged community uh, might come into the fore, um, rather than trying to deal with uh, safety throughout the San Diego and Imperial County region in a really, um, as Sebastian said, that might also be a, a broader study and, and instead maybe just bring it in uh, in the equity framework. So we'll take that back. All right, well, it looks like we have the majority of folks um, on the mentee software. So let's begin. All right, so our first question is meant to elicit your opinion on the scoring of these criteria that Bridget just presented. We know that every category is important, but think of it as if you have 100 points to spend on how you think we should weigh the three categories of criteria. So this is interesting um, just to note that we are still seeing environment uh, as the top um, criteria, but it is more uh, evenly weighted than what we had initially proposed. So let's see if this is 
this trend continues, we might, uh, and then actually pretty evenly weighted with equity, interesting. Uh, so once this is finalized, we'll take this back and confer with um, our project partners. I'll just read out that we got a comment in the chat. In the context of equity, I think safety benefits for disadvantaged communities is a relevant indicator when proposing to create trucking lanes or additional truck parking, alleviating the congestion of trucks on the roads in disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities, et cetera. That's great. Thank you for that feedback. All righty. It looks like we have all of our results in. So with that, let's pivot back to the presentation. But again, please keep your windows open for Mintmeter. Thanks, Annabelle. And so now we're looking at, uh, instead of the benefits, we're looking at cost and impediments. And so in this area, these are things that could make it more difficult, do make it more difficult to implement a project we want to identify projects uh, and push forward projects that are going to be able to be implemented uh, and so the higher the score here the that will be counted against um, a project or program so in the scoring of costs and impediments the areas we're looking at are costs uh, funding stakeholder support technological complexity and planning continuity. So in terms of making um, a project harder to implement, if you have high uh, implementation costs, for example, that can be challenging. We're proposing a weighting of 40% uh, for that area. For funding, we're looking at uh, the degree to which the um, project or program lacks alignment with existing funding programs. So uh, a lack of alignment with funding programs, if it's going to be difficult to, uh, appears to be difficult to obtain funding from existing sources, then that would also be weighted uh, against the project at 10%. Stakeholder support, um, you know, the degree to which uh, implementation will require seeking support of many competing stakeholders who might have uh, contradictory uh, interests um, and that waiting that can slow up a project, for example, uh, or um, prevent it from being implemented altogether. So that waiting is given 15% in our proposal. Technological complexity. So, you know, if a project or program requires, we, Sebastian identified some things that are still in testing. Uh, and or uh, haven't been developed um, for general use yet. So does the implementation require testing or development of new technologies? And that um, complexity would be weighted 15% in our proposal. And then finally, planning continuity. If a project or program is not considered currently in local or regional plans or programs, that is, um, also proposed to be weighted against um, a project or program, and it's uh, at 15% in this framework. So now we're going to ask your input again on these uh, in a mentee poll. And before we do that, it looks like Danielle has a question. Okay. Hi, sorry, getting off mute here. Uh, just a comment really fast with the technological complexity category. Um, you know, technology is generally a good thing. And I like get what you're getting at, but maybe terming it more in frames of like the readiness around the technology that's being considered um, might frame it towards, you know, not necessarily 
having somebody get a worse score because they're using new technology, right? There's different types of emerging technologies and some are kind of more feasible for implementation than others. And then the other consideration around that, that I think you guys should think about including is uh, regulatory barriers. Good, great points. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a, those are both really good points. And the, um, we, we debated this also. <laughs> so you all are picking up right on the, the uh, core issues. So we do want to encourage new technologies. And of course, a lot of the solutions will uh, focus around those. But you're absolutely right, Danielle. We want to focus on those that are a little more ready. Um, they have been tested and are further along in the development path. Um, and things that are really far into the future and uh, much earlier in the path, this is the this is what we're considering giving some um, considering an impediment. So we, we, we can look at the wording of that. Uh, and then in terms of the regulatory barriers, that's a good question. We do need maybe that. Uh, did we talk about that, Tim, in terms of stakeholder support? Or, um, of course, that could also fall under technical complexity. I, that's how I was thinking about it was around technological complexity, because sometimes the technology is actually kind of ready from like the standpoint of development, but regulations and policy around it hasn't quite caught up. Okay. Um, so that's particularly what I was thinking about. Um, that just might not be fully captured as far as implement implementability um, when you're looking at, you know, the technology piece and how how ready it is. It's like, are the regulations to support implementation there as well? Okay. Well, we can okay. certainly look. Yeah, we can add it uh, maybe under an, as another criteria under technological complexity. Or Thank you for the feedback. All righty, then we'll go on to our next poll. There you go. Um, so our next poll is, um, where we're trying to understand, in your opinion, which of the hurdles that we've just discussed are likely the most difficult to overcome? I'm just smiling because I'm seeing uh, technical complexity and stakeholder support keep flipping. Um, so what we're seeing is uh, costs are coming in at the the top in terms of barriers to implementation. Um, funding is next and perhaps a little bit closer than what we had um, given it in terms of weight. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, because the cost may not be as much of a hurdle if you're able to get funding. Uh, stakeholder support and technical complexity seem uh, really evenly weighted here, which is what um, we had proposed. And then planning continuity, a little bit less so maybe, maybe people think uh, innovation and, you know, the region is willing to um, change its plans and adapt them to the future. And I wanna acknowledge there are two comments in the chat box, uh, one from Andrea, and she said, I agree with Ty that smaller tracking companies 
that are themselves members of disadvantaged communities should be considered in equity criteria. And the second one is from Thai. Uh, innovation often goes hand in hand with technological complex complexity, so perhaps lower the weight there. Maybe add policy complexity. Thank you for the feedback. This is Andrea Hoff. I have a, a comment. Go ahead, Andrea. Um, I'm just thinking methodologically, um, if those 10 points, um, two things. One is a question if there's going to be different measures. I know you said they were qualitative measurements. If it is qualitative, it might be challenging to assign, you know, eight versus five points. It might be better just to do like a one, two, three rather than all the way one through 10. Um, and then the question is, are there going to be specific measures that go into that, that scoring? Or is it just, like you said, qualitative, sort of subjective, assigning a two or six? It might just be easier to go one, two, or three, high, medium, low. Just a comment. Yeah, I'm going to turn to, um, that's a good point, and we'll take that under consideration. But Sebastian, did you have thoughts about that? Yeah, so uh, we do intend while while the scoring is qualitative, uh, we will uh, use as many measures and data as possible to inform that qualitative scoring. Um, I mean, the purpose of the scoring is really uh, to rank uh, strategies and projects against each other, right? Uh, and so, it, so it's going to be relative, anyways. Uh, whether it's a one, two, three, or, you know, where we pick a, a one, five, 10, uh, it won't really matter ultimately. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we, we do want to, um, you know, bring in as much uh, data and evidence as we can in this project uh, in scoring uh, the different strategies. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. All right, let's give it one more minute and then move on to the next one. We had a couple more people weigh in on the last time, but maybe some people have had to pop out of the meeting. I'm not sure. Okay. Should we continue? Yes, I think so. Great. Let's do that. All righty. And then our last poll is kind of a catch all for anything that we missed. We welcome any other comments or feedback here. For example, feedback on specific criteria, definitions, or any other project attributes that we should consider for prioritization. And then just to clarify, Annabelle, people can type right um, what they want into this poll. Maybe yes. people already felt they got it off their chest when we okay. had the discussion, then that's fine. But if if anyone's confused, go ahead and just type it in. A few words, it's a phrase. Yes, thank you for clarifying. So we have multi-jurisdictional coordination. Um, I could see a couple of different interpretations of that and falling under sort of stakeholder support. Are you thinking that that uh, whoever said that, if they'd like to speak up and explain, is that something that, um, how would that come into the scoring framework?
Hi, Bridget. This is Diva from Fair and Peers. Um, that was my comment. Um, a lot of the times, the most important projects are the most complex. So I guess it falls under technical complexity, but I think it's overlooked a lot. For example, I'm working on a project in Box Tract in the city of Stockton, but the neighborhood is in San Joaquin County and the port of Stockton is right next to it. And the projects in that area have just been very difficult to implement because of all the coordination that's needed to be involved in, in Caltrans and the um, um, the county planning organization. Um, it just it's just a factor. Mm -hmm. So that would maybe be a impediment to implementation and the way you're describing it. It might. I, I would maybe put that under stakeholder support that it requires support of many competing stakeholders, including multi jurisdictional under that. That's a good point. Yes. So now we also see the consider the impacts of other modes of transportation. Does the person who said that want to clarify was that impacts to those modes or impacts of, I guess, of those modes? In other words, um... it goes both. It goes both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it's it's almost impossible to implement anything without looking at how it works with everything else. And it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone suggests we look at uh, others' approaches from around the country. Um, we certainly did look at those in terms of the mm -hmm. best practices, mm -hmm. but I think what specifically this comment is saying, did we look at it in terms of the, the scoring and the measurement? Um, and I'm sure we did, but uh, Sebastian, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, we, we looked at those, um, you know, we've, We've implemented, as you know, Bridget, similar scorings elsewhere uh, for, for a variety of other cities. Um, yeah, um, the, the person that wrote this comment, do they have any specific example or, uh, or scoring framework uh, we should also be looking at? Hi, Sebastian, this is Maurice Eden with Caltrans. Um, I wrote the comment. I, I didn't have any like top of mind uh, other um, thoughts on approaches, but was just curious on you know how what we're looking at and you know the methodology that you guys have been discussing how that aligns with um, I mean even if you just constrain your look to let's say California you know you can look at the Bay Area you could look at LA Long Beach and you know see if we're uh, you know from a methodology standpoint if if we're close to what they have, not to say that they're right and we're wrong or, you know, we're right and they're wrong, but just to see if there's, you know, other things that um, that we may want to consider. And then uh, we get a comment here about safety as well. And um, again, the nuance between <laughs> different scoring um, uh, thresholds. Do we do one, two, three if we don't have enough nuance to distinguish, say, a seven from an eight? Uh, so we'll need to be careful how we, uh, that, that we're able to explain how the different scores are assigned. And we may want to simplify some of them, uh, perhaps. Okay, and then I'm. Uh, Just wanted to chime in here, Bridget, oh, that uh, all of this feedback has been great. Um, but I think it would be good if we could uh, kind of wrap wrap this up. And okay, I was just gonna say, I wonder how we're other, doing on time. <laughs> yeah, I think we'd like to get to the next presentation. Okay. So I uh, hate yeah. to hurry it along, but thank you for all the feedback from the participants. Yeah. 
All righty, let's do that and go back to the implementation strategy framework and next steps. Okay, so we're going to take all the feedback we heard um, from the task force today uh, and uh, work with our project partners to finalize the uh, scoring framework, prioritization framework, and then projects, programs would be ranked um, as they're developed in the next um, task according to the implementation strategy score, which would be developed uh, as shown uh, in this formula. So the score would be the benefits uh, total score over the cost total score. And that's my last um, slide on the prioritization framework. And just to, to say the obvious with, with that formula, uh, you'll essentially focus on the projects that achieve the most benefits per cost and impediments, right? Uh, and so you're, 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 you're putting your, your time, effort, and money uh, where you're likely going to get the, the highest return. Thanks. And then Mariela? Yes, again, uh, today's agenda. So just we summarize very quickly what we cover today, uh, the project goals and expected uh, outcomes, project timeline, existing plans, um, the best practices and draft uh, screening framework. And now we'll go on to the next steps. Sorry, wrong way. Um, We'll be incorporating all the comments from today's meeting uh, into our final existing conditions assessment and also refine the screening criteria with all the great input that you guys uh, provided. And if you have any additional comments or feedback, please submit that uh, by Friday, July 22nd. Uh, you can email me the comments uh, or Bridget as well. Um, also, um, we're going to be providing in the interim between today and the next uh, phrase stakeholder meeting um, the maps for the project for you to provide us with uh, input and changes, additions, um, whatever it may be. Um, and our next meeting will be tentatively in November. And at that meeting, we'll be reviewing the innovative strategy screening and the stakeholder interview results. And that concludes our presentation. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to email us uh, with our information. Great. All right. Thank you to the Sustainable Freight Strategy Project team. I'm going to take back over. Thank you. Screen share. Uh, and just uh, one thing to point out before we move on to the next item um, that if you're in the agenda, um, Hope that you can see my screen. Um, number six, if you click on the item six, the draft existing conditions report and best practices um, is included as a report. Uh, it's about 40 pages long. So if you would like to take a look at that and provide comments to Mariella or Bridget, that would be fantastic. Uh, so we'll move on to item seven. Um, this is the San Diego Regional Medium and Heavy Duty Zero Emission Vehicle Blueprint Overview. Uh, so we'll be going to Jeff Hoyos uh, from Sandag for the presentation. So Jeff. All right, thanks, Tim. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Hoyos. I am a regional planner here on the climate team, uh, and I am the project manager for the California Energy Commission San Diego Regional Medium and Heavy Duty Zero Emission Vehicle Blueprint. This is a, a grant from the Energy Commission um, that we'll be working on over the next year and a half. And we have partnered with the Port of San Diego and the Environmental Health Coalition as the core project team for this. And we have uh, Fair and Peers and ICF on board as our consultants that will be helping us with this work. So today we're introducing the project. We just kicked off our project. And so mostly gonna give an overview of the project and allow for some questions at the end here. Um, you know, the, the region really has not completed a zero emission 
uh, specific blueprint for trucks and buses. Uh, and so we've done it for passenger vehicles in the past. And so we're, we're taking a little bit more of a finer um, approach to the sustainable freight strategy here and looking specifically at trucks and buses and how we can set the region up for success to transition to zero emission vehicles. Um, and so let's go to the next slide here. Um, so, you know, the state of California and the region has some pretty ambitious goals for uh, truck and bus electrification. Um, and, and, you know, in the next 10 years or so. And so this blueprint will help guide SANDAG with uh, policies, programs, and incentives or funding for uh, programs and, and policies that will, you know, that we can support the, what I should say here is the regional plan identified over $2 billion of funding for clean transportation needs in the next uh, 30 years. And uh, from that, uh, just about $800, $900 million for medium duty uh, vehicles. So that's transit and, and freight. Um, so there's a lot of money that's going to be needed in order to help support the transition to the the, the clean transportation take, excuse me clean transportation future and so this blueprint will really help identify some of those near mid and long term strategies that can help us get there um all right so i am going to be co-presenting with sam today and, and so i think we can hop over to the next slide um and I, I will hand it over to sam he's the project lead from uh, icf Thank you, Jeff. So uh, I'm Sam Pernazari, Director of Clean Transportation at ICF. So as Jeff mentioned, um, really the, the the objective of this blueprint is, is to highlight, I mean, the needs, the challenges, the barriers, and some of the implementation strategies, near-term as well as long-term, uh, to roll out medium and heavy-duty zero-emission technologies uh, within the region. So we are going to complete this project through seven tasks as shown on this slide. I mean, task one is really the administrations, but then, uh, but basically at the core of the technical tasks are first of all, I mean, identifying the needs, looking at what the region has already done in terms of planning, looking at the port trip transition plan, looking at the uh, community emission reduction plan, as well as other plans that are being developed, trying to identify the needs for the region to move toward zero emission, medium and heavy duty trucks. Uh, then in task three is, is basically just, I mean, something that may come toward the end of trying to provide some fact sheets and website development for outreach and, and communicating the, um, the outcome of this project. We also have an outreach and engagement plan within this project where we are trying to uh, form a stakeholder group. I mean, um, combining from, from different um, stakeholders that are involved in, in, in either develop, development of the strategies or implementation of those strategies and trying to have like quarterly stakeholder meetings uh, in coordination with the other effort that uh, was just presented um, and trying to definitely engage um, and, and get feedback from, from, from you guys, from other stakeholders uh, in terms of like how the strategies and how this blueprint needs to be shaped. Uh, moving from there, we are going to um, really define and develop um, some medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle technology and site and greater. And I'm going to get a little bit into the details of what that means in terms of like how we can define some siting criteria and providing guidance on how to site EV infrastructure as well as fueling infrastructure for hydrogen vehicles, plus like what sort of guidance we can provide fleets when they're considering transitioning towards zero emission vehicles. At the end, we're going to really define some implementation strategies and, and trying to look at not only the things that Sande can do, but also the variety of stakeholders that are getting that are being involved in this project, what sort of actions they can take in the near term as well as long term to um, to accelerate and facilitate this transition towards zero emission uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles. Maybe we can go to the next slide. All right, so um, as I mentioned, I mean, as the very, very first step in terms of like, I mean, uh, tackling this project is, is really identifying the needs. Um, so um, so basically, we will start by reviewing the, the port priorities, the truck transition plan, um, and, and trying to identify like how many zero emission, medium and um, heavy duty vehicles are we expecting to see uh, in the near term. I mean, Portis has, has some ambitious goals toward like fully transition their 
their fleet to zero emission. Um, and in addition to that, the San Diego um, APCD's uh, community emission reduction plan for Port Southern Environmental Justice neighborhoods has also identified some goals for um, reducing emissions from, from trucks and, and, and buses in general by transitioning them towards zero emission technologies. So a compilation of these reviews will let us know like what sort of how many num what number of zero emission vehicles and what needed charging infrastructure should be there in order to, to meet those goals. From there, we will um, try to do a market study. I mean, by market study, we're going to look at like, I mean, today, how many zero emission truck technology models are out there? I mean, what are the total costs of ownership of those? What is the status of the charging and fueling infrastructure within the region? I mean, what sort of, I mean, charging infrastructure are these vehicles, these vehicles need? Or what sort of charging infrastructure is already being deployed? And, and try to also, I mean, bring in a perspective from some of the pilots that have been implemented within the region or even outside of the region within California and trying to shed light on what, what's the status of the market today, what's the status of the market in the near term within the next two to three years, and, and how fast this transition can really happen. From there, uh, we will go and do some scenario assessment. I mean, we will try to look at the, um, considering the port truck transition plan, as well as the other planning efforts that I mentioned, uh, as well as the efforts that California Air Resources Board is considering in terms of the regulatory actions that they're considering with the fleet rules, with the zero emission dray truck rule, um, in, and trying to determine how many medium and heavy duty vehicles we are anticipating over the next 10 to 15 years um, to be in the region. So we're going to do some of that scenario assessment, trying to determine the number of vehicles, zero emission vehicles, from there anticipating and estimating the number of either charging as well as fueling infrastructure. By fueling, I mean mainly hydrogen fueling infrastructure needed in the region. Uh, and try to compile all this information into a needs assessment report, which basically, um, as I said, provide I mean, information on, on the current planning effort and the current status of the market and where the market is planning to go or anticipated to go into the future and what would be the need for the charging and fueling infrastructure uh, in the future. So if you go to the next slide, uh, as part of this project, we're also doing an outreach and engagement. And my colleague, Kara Kong, um, if she is on the call, she will help me to cover this slide. So maybe I'll pass it on to Kara. She's still on. Hey, everyone. Can you, can you hear me? Hi. Thank you, Sam. Um, yes, as part of this uh, contract that ICF is working on with Fair and Pierce, we'll be helping Sandad to facilitate um, stakeholder engagement outreach. And we'll also be working very closely with the Environmental Health Coalition. Um, but we will, um, first of all, create a, a stakeholder group roster. So we'll be working closely with, with this group um, with, to, uh, to incorporate uh, industry experts, uh, community experts, community-based organizations to make sure that we're um, getting the right feedback from the right groups. Um, and we'll be coordinating all, the, all the, the meetings and preparing agendas and probably come back to you with uh, several um, opportunities and workshops to, uh, to, to get that feedback from you. And we'll also be working to um, uh, put together a plan, again, working close along, alongside with the Environmental Health Coalition, who will be helping us to develop materials and also identifying uh, you know, the right uh, communities to be talking to, the communities of concern that are often impacted by um, heavy duty and medium duty freight emissions. <laughs> Um, and, and, and we'll be, through, all throughout the way, we'll be helping to create content um, that's easy to understand, helps break things down in, in ways that you know, the average person can, can understand and, and help provide some um, uh, valuable insight too. And, um, and that's the high level, but we're happy to answer questions at the end. Thanks, Kara. If we can move to the next slide, I'm gonna uh, go through this quickly since we only have six minutes left. So, um, as part of, I mean, once we have the, uh, the needs assessments and as we're doing the public outreach as well as the stakeholder engagement, we'll also try to develop this, I mean, what we call technology and siting criteria. So one of the key things in really the facilitating the transition to zero emission, medium and heavy duty is proper siting of charging and fueling infrastructure. If those 
I mean, there are, currently there are not a lot of those out there, if any, for medium and heavy duty trucks. Uh, and, and, and definitely the funding is limited. We can we don't have all the funding to install or deploy all the charging infrastructure. I mean, in any place we need. So those need to be done very strategically. So as part of this task, what we're planning to do is doing a, a thorough research in terms of like what sort of criteria a local government needs to consider when tar tar they're trying to deploy a public charging or public fueling infrastructure, even not only local, but also private sector, what sort of criteria they need to consider. So those criteria could include like utilization factor, how, where, where to deploy those charges so they can be, uh, they can have a maximum utilizations, um, what sort of grid interconnections will be needed, how they can use the inter integration capacity analysis maps from the from the utilities, specifically Sanyo Gas and Electric, to determine which locations are ready for, for those charging infrastructure deployment or for fueling infrastructure deployment. And also definitely considering and bringing equity into, into this whole uh, equation for, uh, for, for determining those siting criteria. Aside from the siting criteria, we're also trying to develop I mean, some criteria for fleet to determine like what technology best suits them when they're trying to transition to zero emission technology and providing that um, guidance to fleet as they're considering uh, moving away from combustion into a new technology where, I mean, basically they may not already, they may not have all the knowledge that they did with the combustion technology in the past. So moving to the next slide, uh, once we are doing all of that research, then we get into the implementation strategy. So for implementation strategy, we will try to first leverage the work done so far. We will, I mean, look at the, I mean, comments and feedback from the stakeholder engagement as well as the public outreach being done. We'll look at the uh, needs assessment we conducted in task two. We will look at the research we conducted in the previous task in terms of the siting criteria and technology criteria. We will also leverage the best practices that has been um, has been considered, uh, considering the, the regional goals, economics of the medium and heavy duty zero emission fleet, as well as the workforce training and development needs. And with all of those uh, elements, uh, we will try to lay out some near term as well as long term implementation strategies. Those could be like effective incentive programs and technology demonstrations. Those could be some local policies for permitting, fee bait, public outreach and education. And also, I mean, strategies that can really enhance equity and advance environmental justice outcomes of this transition to zero emission uh, technology, where those infrastructures need to be deployed in order to um, increase the operation of those zero emission technologies within those disadvantaged, low income disadvantaged communities. With all of these components um, uh, in mind, uh, we will move on to, uh, to the last task, which is really um, pulling the blueprint together, um, where it will summarize the research and analysis that we conducted. It will lay out the near-term and long-term strategies that we have developed as part of this plan. And uh, one of the key things that we try that we plan to do is really defining the roles for each of the stakeholders and responsibility for each of the stakeholders in terms of the implementation of the blueprint. Uh, with that, I will be happy to get um, any questions or, or comments uh, if you have. Thanks, Sam. I, I'll just add one more thing that we're planning on coming back to this group, uh, as uh, Tim had mentioned at the beginning of this meeting. Uh, we'll, we'll be coming to this group regularly to provide to get input from you all, um, provide some of the deliverables for review, um, and and really leverage this 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 wealth of knowledge to help inform the blueprint. All right, great. Thank you, Sam and Jeff. Any other um, feedback um, from the participants? Okay, I will. Pull up the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, pull up the agenda. So we'll now move on to item number eight. So this is comprehensive multimodal corridor plan updates. Um, two of them, San Vicente and South Bay to Sorrento. Uh, so we'll go over to Mimi Morisaki as well as Zach Brat for the next presentation, as well as Melina Pereira and Ramon Martinez from Caltrans. So take it away. All right. Good morning, and thank you all. As Tim mentioned, I'm Mimi Morisaki. I'm a senior planner at Sandag. 
uh, where I'm currently managing two of these comprehensive multimodal corridor plans or CMCPs, as you may have heard it. Um, and we have Melina Pereira here as well, and Ramon Martinez from Caltrans. Um, they are the Caltrans PMs on the corridors we're going to give an update on today. And Zach from Sandeg is also here to provide an update. So again, thank you for having us. And on the next slide, please. This is a quick overview of today's discussion. First, we'll provide some background on the CMCPs, what they are and how they fit in with the regional plan. And then after that, we will provide an overview of the San Vicente corridor and the solutions proposed related to traffic congestion and goods movement. And then we'll do the same uh, for the South Bay to Sereno corridor. And we'll be available after to answer any questions or comments after our presentation. Next slide, please. So in September 2019, the Sandag Board of Directors allocated $40 million to develop 11 corridor plans throughout the region. And the CMCPs build upon the state and regional plans and take a more detailed look at transportation and selected areas of the region. So they use travel and demographic data, community plans, and public input to develop multimodal transportation solutions to provide better access to jobs, education, and services. And these corridor plans look at all transportation modes like transit, highways, local roadways, biking, walking, flexible fleets, goods movement, and the technologies needed to help them all work together efficiently. We have six of these corridor plans in development right now as a joint effort between Sandag and Caltrans. And uh, we have also been in close coordination with local jurisdictions and partner agencies and uh, stakeholders, community stakeholders. Uh, we also wanted to note that the SR125 CMCP process will be kicking off later this fiscal year. Um, on the next slide, the CMCPs incorporate information from state and local documents, including the 2021 Regional Plan, the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure, the California Transportation Plan, and other local community plans. And after a CMCP is approved, individual projects, programs, and policies outlined in the document can apply for various federal, state, and local funding opportunities, such as SB1 funding. Um, ordinarily, a package of projects doesn't receive funding all at the same time, and funding for individual solutions is often received over the course of multiple years. So once funding is secured, the project will be added to the Regional Transportation Improvement Program, or RTIP, uh, which is a multi-billion dollar five-year program of major transportation projects with secured funding from federal, state, and local sources. And from there, additional environmental analysis, design, and construction is needed to make these projects a reality. Next slide, please. So I'll hand it over to Melina to provide an overview of the San Vicente Corridor. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melina Pereira, and I am a senior transportation planner at Caltrans and the project manager for the I-8 Kumeyaay Corridor, as well as the San Vicente CMCP on the Caltrans side with Mimi from Sandag. Can we advance to the next slide? So this corridor connects the unincorporated communities of Ramona and Lakeside to the city of Poway and the San Diego region and provides access to the tribal lands. Um, the study area represented by the slightly darker color on the map is the focus of our proposed transportation solutions. Um, the surrounding lighter color on the map is the area of influence and represents the area that will likely be impacted by the proposed improvements. Um, so transportation solutions proposed in our draft CMCP are only identified within the corridor study area, but not precluded from continuing into the area of influence and beyond to complete network gaps and create a more comprehensive transportation system. Next slide. Uh, this slide identifies the seven needs for the San Vicente Corridor that have been developed in collaboration with stakeholders and members of the public. These needs were the guide for developing the transportation solutions that follow, and the full list is in Chapter 4 of our draft CMCP. 
So today we're going to focus on traffic congestion and goods movement, those two categories. Next slide, please. So during our planning process, we found that the corridor is heavily utilized for both commuting and recreational purposes. And therefore, traffic congestion can be an issue on both weekdays as well as weekends. The center central corridor transports agricultural goods, aggregate, wine, livestock, and equestrian supplies. Special events like rodeos also draw significant truck traffic. Significant, uh, well, specifically for this corridor, trucks make up about 7%, um, an average of 7% of total vehicles on SR67. Given our findings, we have proposed transportation solutions such as truck climbing lanes, smart intersection systems, shuttles, and rideshare programs in order to enhance the corridor's efficiency. Next slide. So the draft CMCP was released for public review on May 31st, and the public comment period will close next week on July 30th. Uh, the final CMCP document is expected to be completed by September of 2022. Next slide. So the draft CMCP can be accessed on the virtual engagement hub for review and comment. There's a QR code on the slide that you can scan. Um, the website address is also shown on the slide. And here are the various ways to communicate with us regarding this project. Uh, we look forward to the discussion after this presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to Ramon and Zach to discuss the South Lake to Sorrento CMCP. Okay, uh, thank you, Melina. Um, good morning, my name is Ramon Martinez. And I am the, um, the project manager, the quarter project manager for the I-805, Interstate 805 quarter. And I also represent Caltrans uh, on the South Bay to Sorrento quarter CMCP. Uh, today, we're going to provide an update on the CMCP. Um, uh, with a focus on the goods movement and freight operations. Next slide. <clears throat> Doing a quick overview of the study area, we are focused on the, on the Interstate 805 corridor. This corridor stretches uh, from the international border in the south to the, to the Sorrento Valley in the north. The southern half of the corridor includes Interstate 5, and the surrounding areas, as well as Coronado. Uh, the, the study also includes uh, State Route 905. This is one of the largest corridors in the San Diego region, and it includes nearly a quarter of the region's population, a third of the region's jobs, and one-fifth of the region's homes. Our, stu uh, our study focused on four major challenges for this region. Um, the first one is um, a mobility concerns for all modes that are prevalent in the quarter, including a lack of north-south connections for the transit, uh, gaps in connectivity for cyclists and pedestrians, and significant congestion and delays uh, on highways that affect commuters and goods movement. A large portion of the, dis uh, or the second is uh, a large portion of the region's disadvantaged communities live within this corridor. And the same mobility challenges, uh, challenges are often greater for those communities. These areas often lack high quality connections or transportation connections uh, that are uh, and are faced with long travel times to get to jobs and other destinations. The third is uh, considering the environment. This quarter has uh, major challenges with air pollution and air quality, as well as threats to our climate, uh, that climate change uh, poses on transportation infrastructure in the corridor. And the last is when we, when we look at land use, issues arise because of the sprawling nature um, of the corridor, the lack of diversity of land uses that are close to each other. And this leads to travel times that are uh, between housing and employment centers. Uh, slide 15, yes. 
to get a feel for the public's perspective on this quarter plan, we conducted extensive public outreach. It included uh, 3,500 visits to our virtual engagement hub and over 300 survey responses. As part of this outreach, we also hosted several stakeholder and public meetings attended by hundreds of people from the region who live, work, and play in the quarter. We also conducted a specific stakeholder and industry outreach, including prior visits to freight stakeholders, uh, the, the, the freight stakeholders working group, which is you, uh, that was done back in February of 2021. Uh, I'll now hand over the presentation over to Sack, uh, Sack and Neil is going to do a little more discussion on the transportation solutions. Thank you. Thanks, Ramon. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Zachary Brott. I'm a regional planner here at Sandag. Um, and here on this slide, we see um, some of the major freeways in the corridor, like Ramon discussed. Um, we see some of the major points of congestion that we have in the corridor indicated in yellow and orange. So along I-805 and I-5, our study area contains three of the most 10 congested areas and 10 of the top 50 most congested areas in the region. So anyone who travels on the 805 during peak hours is definitely well aware of this, uh, but the busiest parts of our corridor lie in the middle of the study area between SR-94 and Interstate 8. You can see that grouping of the orange and yellow dots there. Uh, during peak periods, we also see significant congestion farther north at the interchange with SR-52 and along Interstate 5 as it passes through downtown San Diego. Additionally, we see on this map some of the most impacted points for good movement traffic in the corridor. And as many of you have probably experienced, uh, there are several throughout the study area. They include the warehouses up north in Miramar and Kearney Mesa, uh, coastal transport and gas companies going east and west on interchange uh, at Interstate 8, uh, along the waterfront ports in San Diego and National City on Interstate 5, and along the international border uh, at both San Ysidro and Ote Mesa. The next slide, please. So to mitigate these issues, our study team has developed a list of over 300 transportation solution strategies to improve circulation and safety throughout the corridor. Of these solutions, 98 of them include a focus on goods movement in the corridor. And here we see some of the major projects that we identified. Uh, the Harbor Drive improvements um, will ameliorate congestion issues along the waterfront. Uh, the Port of San Diego, the National City Marine Terminal, and Able Bay San Diego. This will run along Harbor Drive and Interstate 5. Uh, these improvements will be multimodal, so they'll include a variety of improvements for passenger vehicles, commercial vehicles and trucks, cyclists, pedestrians, transit, and it'll make a better and safer experience for all users. Uh, second, we have the OTA Mesa East Port of Entry, which will provide a third border crossing with a focus on commercial activity and goods movement. This is one of Sandeg's priority projects in collaboration with Caltrans and our other partners. And when it's open, when it opens, it's expected to reduce border wait time significantly at all three ports of entry, allowing for smoother border crossings for users of all modes and making transnational travel more efficient and economical, uh, especially for trucking and goods movement purposes. With shorter wait times and fewer vehicles stalling near the ports of entry, we should also be able to see significant air quality improvements uh, along the border region. And third here, we have the San Ysidro Mobility Hub which is another multimodal project uh, that will improve operations for freight carriers as well as other users, taking advantage of new technology improvements included in our next operating system and other enhancements for a better overall experience around the border. Uh, across the corridor, we have a system planned of managed lanes, including HOT lanes, uh, potential truck lanes and dynamic lanes proposed for I-5 and I-805 to better manage congestion and new technology to support autonomous vehicles, vehicle to infrastructure communications, and manage lane implementation that will make for a smoother overall experience along the corridor. Get the next slide, please. And so as we look ahead, we're just about ready to finalize the corridor plan. Uh, so we're really excited to get it done and look forward to funding opportunities for some of the projects in the plan, which we're already looking for some managed lane connectors um, as part of a, a funding opportunity this fall. We released the draft CMCP to the document on June to the public on June 17th. Um, and our comment period is open until next Friday, July 29th. And after we review the comments and make any necessary modifications, we expect that the final CMCP to be approved in late August of this year. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Our draft document can be found online at the Virtual Engagement Hub, as well as on Sandag's website. And so please feel free to get into contact with us about the plan uh, using any, any of the methods that we have listed here on the site, on the slide. 
All right, thank you presenters. Are there any uh, participants in the meeting today who have any questions for our CMCP team? I see a hand from Diane Takorian. I'll let you go ahead. Diane? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's an exciting uh, set of projects. I had kind of a specific question related to the slide where you're showing the Harbor Drive improvements and wondered what the engagement, if any, of the San Diego Police Department is. Yes, probably many of you know we've uh, advocated for a long time to have a uh, truck route, uh, particularly for the trucks coming out of the ports, uh, 10th Avenue Terminal and National City Terminal. Um, unfortunately, uh, we still have a lack of enforcement for the many, many trucks that do not abide by the truck route. So while these improvements are um, hopefully coming in the, probably the next decade, um, is there any consideration for how we can have better enforcement of the truck route? I, I can try to answer that. Um, the um, uh, enforcement, I mean, the, the CMCP is uh, different than previous quarter plans are looking at policy policy issues uh, such as that. I mean, we have a similar issue with the um, the HOV enforcement on, on uh, 805, right? There's a lot of people that are not, uh, um, that are not HOVs, right? It's only one person. But uh, a lot of people figure out that there's no enforcement. So that is one of the, uh, the, the considerations of, of the uh, South Bay to Sorrento CMCP, one of the issues we're looking at. Well, I mean, the community has been talking about this for years, so it's not, I, I just wonder if you have solutions in mind. I mean, what it's, yeah. if the SDPD is not willing to allow uh, anyone other than a police officer to um, ticket these trucks or to do education uh, for the drivers, then um, it has to be an enforcement issue by a police officer. So it seems like they've narrowed the field of what the uh, options can be. Um, so support from Sandeg uh, for that enforcement um, within this plan would be uh, really welcome or alternatives. Honestly, I, I, I don't think it really requires police officers, which I, who I think are busy and there, we have a shortage of them. So perhaps we can think about alternatives um, so that we can have enforcement of the truck route. And just, are those included at all in the plan and, and could they be? Yeah, I, 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 like I was saying, it's, we are looking at enforcement, right? As Because all these measures, if, if, if there's no consequence for not doing what you're supposed to do as a, as a motorist or truck driver, I mean, then the whole plan is not going to work. So I, I can tell you that it is being considered, um, and we're going to take your your suggestion specifically, uh, make sure that it is uh, that we are looking at it. But there are um, it's hard to kind of get into it. There's all sorts of um, <clears throat> organizational barriers and and law, right? Uh, asking someone that's not a police officer to stop someone to issue a ticket. For us, it's a straightforward issue, but uh, for them, it's very complicated. So, um, so we are trying to break down those organizational barriers, but it's uh, that's one of the reasons for doing a comprehensive multimodal corridor plan, right? It's it's looking at all of those issues that often in the past we haven't looked at. Great. No, that's exciting, and um, happy to share any other information. You can just contact me. I I think. Um, I, I totally agree. I don't think we want um, folks to be stopping trucks, but I think there's a lot of education is really necessary. A lot of truck drivers just aren't aware. So if they were to receive a letter that says, you know, you were observed, um, not on the truck route, so please observe it. I just think that would go a long way, even as a soft kind of education. So thanks for your response and um, Environmental Health Coalition is happy to help in any way that we can. Ramon, do you, do you mind if I just chime in from a trucking perspective just really quickly? Okay. Um, so Diane, um, you're absolutely right. The education component seems to be where the barrier is in a lot of respects. Um, the Barrio Logan community plan, you know, has very clearly laid out 
um, the, you know, the truck routes that, you know, go through that community. Um, but from what I, you know, in talking to my trekking colleagues, I'm finding out that um, very often um, there's, there's some confusion about wh where they're actually supposed to be. And um, trucks that are actually making deliveries into the community often, you know, are confused about where they're supposed to deliver. So education is really, really key here, uh, along with, you know, appropriate signage. Um, signage would go a long way, a long way, you know, additional, clear, um, and ever-present signage. So that would, that's the trucking perspective. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's, there's a ton of signs. Um, so any specific thoughts you have about where those could go would be really welcome, I think, for the for the city and the port. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, trucks that are making local deliveries are exempted. Um, so they can uh, deliver to the grocery store and to the bakeries and uh, to any of the other industries um, within the neighborhood. Uh, it's the trucks that are going in and out of the port terminals. And so any I know that the port had uh, flyers uh, created that were supposed to be being handed out to the truckers, which seems like it's a responsibility of uh, you know, those who are employing the truckers uh, to give them a clear uh, map of the truck route. And, and this isn't just in the Barrio Logan plan, it's adopted by the city council. So it actually is an official policy of the city, but thanks. And let's figure out a way to, to do better on their education. Great, thank you, Diane and Ty. Are there any other comments on the, uh, the CMCP item? I have a brief comment. This is Andrea Hoff at Sandag. I was interested, I'm, I'm very interested in this um, CMCP, particularly as it relates to the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry project and its presentation in your slides. I'll uh, work with staff to provide some comments offline, but I think there's some opportunities to add a few icons um, for resiliency in the next OS for the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry project. I, I noticed there was only an icon for um, goods movement, but there's a border wait time system and regional border management system that's being implemented along with that project. And we're creating a relief valve, which uh, it will improve resiliency in the region. Um, there's also an opportunity to point out some of the congestion areas in the border region and perhaps taking a look at that, that truck route, I noticed that it didn't go all the way to the border or the, the multimodal. So just a heads up that I might, I might offline provide a few comments to enhance the presentation of that important project for your important plan. Great, thanks Andrea. And just a reminder that the comment deadline for South Bay to Sereno is July 29th. And the comment deadline for San Vicente is July 30th. Uh, so thank you. Um, if there's no other comments, so I'll move on to the next item, number nine. All right, so this is agency updates, freight stakeholders agency updates. I have a couple, but I'm inviting anybody else, any other agencies who have an update to share here at this time. So please raise a hand or start talking either way. Do you have any updates? All right, I will go on to the two that I have then. Um, so the first one is uh, about Sen Senate Bill 671. Um, so we had presented on this item uh, last, uh, last meeting in March. Um, we don't have a full update today, but just a reminder that it's a planning effort led by the California Transportation Commission to identify freight corridors and infrastructure needed to support medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicles across the state. So definitely in line with the, the work that we're doing uh, in the region. Um, this is a state working group. Um, there is a website now and I can provide the, um, the website in the chat for this, uh, the CTC's working group um, with more information. Uh, and that right now we're working on completing project request forms which are due September 1st. Purpose of this task being to provide CTC staff with information about projects at various stages in the planning and development phase for medium and heavy duty zero emission charging infrastructure projects. So that includes publicly and pri privately implemented projects. So the CTC is compiling this information into a report for state legislators with possible outcomes being newer revised laws and programs to address existing barriers and recommend planned projects for existing funding <laughs> programs. So if you have information about 
a planned um, medium heavy duty zero emission vehicle infrastructure project. Uh, please contact me so that we can work together on getting some information to the CTC so they can help uh, make that project a reality. So I'll put that um, website in the chat uh, that has more information and note that there is an upcoming meeting for that work group on Friday, this Friday um, at 10 a.m. July 22nd. Um, it's not on the website at the moment. So if you're interested in joining that work group meeting, uh, I can send you the invitation. So please contact me. Um, and I have one other update on the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program, um, which um, is a freight infrastructure competitive funding program through Senate Bill 1 and also administered by the California Transportation Commission. Entities eligible to apply for this program are responsible for de developing their own applications, but Sandeg is responsible for compiling applications from within the San Diego region and submitting them to the CTC. So if you're planning to apply for TSEP for your organization, please get in touch with Mariella or myself as soon as possible so that we're expecting your application and can work together. The call for projects is likely to be announced in August with an application deadline in November 2022. Any other agency updates on item number nine? Running out of time here, so if anybody else has an update, please let me know now. Okay, not seeing any. Um, so item number 10, uh, upcoming meeting. Our next meeting for this task force is tentatively scheduled for November 2022. So we'll let you know, uh, hopefully at least a month in advance, um, when, when we're going to have that date and save the date for that. Um, welcome your participation as we bring some of these items forward again as we move forward with our projects, the sustainable freight implementation strategy and the medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle blueprint. With that, we'll move to item number 11, adjournment. So thank you all for spending your time with us this morning, providing great feedback on our projects. Um, reminder to go comment on the CMC piece if you have anything else to add. And uh, thank you all for participating. We'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, thank Tim. you. Mariela. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye now. Bye. Thank you, thank you all. Bye.